Jake, are ready? Ready? Everything ready? So what do you know? Okay, I'm going to assume everything's ready, I hope. Okay, welcome to uh, EHH, uh, Extreme History at Hertzberg's this week. The, uh, as you know, we're going to do one whole swoop like we did last year with the uh, Pearl Harbor um, every night this week. And that way, uh, I'll be able to scratch the surface of this very complicated subject because you have no idea, but you will, how complicated the, uh, the topic is. It's 100 years, as you all know, since the Balfour Declaration, 1917. 2017, I don't have to say any more than that to this uh, audience. Uh, if you are observant, you will see constantly uh, media reports and articles in the paper and scholars battling it out, uh, pro-Israel, pro-Arab, this and that and the other. And uh, it is a complicated subject. It could be explained in different ways. I'm going to do it in my way, obviously. Uh, so, first of all, let me just say uh, that I want to thank the technical crew over here. Looked at all the wiring that has to go into all this. Uh, I'm particularly uh, grateful to uh, he who shall not be named over there. That should be a schist for the sum of the nift of his mother. I am very happy to note uh, the Albams had a big simcha the other day, and Ari's not here. He's where he should be with his wife somewhere else. <laughs> so I think everybody owes a round of applause and congratulations, happy ending. If you stay here long enough, you get married. That's how it goes. The uh, well, that, it's, it's history teaches this. History teaches this. Okay, and uh, anyhow, you remember where you heard it. I don't want to uh, waste any time with uh, preliminaries. So let me just say, for uh, basic purposes. This is a series of uh, five lectures on the Balfour Declaration. Uh, it'll be every night this week, hopefully, uh, at the same time at 8 o'clock. Tonight, we'll jump right into the first one, entitled Zionism, the Impossible Dream. So here we go. Uh, obviously, the Balfour Declaration is associated. Should I plug this in anywhere? Okay, it's fine, okay. I see, I see yours. Okay, no problem. Sure. Uh, is associated with the, is, with, with the rise of this brand new movement that never existed before in Jewish history called Zionism. So what are we talking about? This is a very co complex, that's a word I'll keep coming back to, and uh, controversial perhaps, uh, topic, because you can give all kinds of different definitions and they're all true. On the one hand, one can say Zionism is a specific movement that started in 1897 and achieved astonishing success it secured a Balfour Declaration within 20 years. So 1897 to 1917, 20 years later, they got the Balfour Declaration. And uh, another 20, or another 30 years later, they got the State of Israel. Uh, so 1897 to 1947, you know, that's when the United Nations gave the petition re re resolution. It's, it's pretty quick as things go. Um, and that's one way of doing it. And therefore, you just chronicle Herzl, 1897, Weizmann, 1917, Ben Gurion, 1947, 48, and there you go. Now, I'll give you a different definition, which is equally true. Zionism is a specific movement that started in 1897 for the purpose of saving the six million Jews of Europe, but which proved to be an astonishing failure, uh, securing a Jewish state just too late to save the victims of the Shoah. If it had been May 15, 1938, instead of May 15, 1948, obviously Jewish history would look a lot different. So Zionism could be a tremendous success. Alternatively, it could be a tremendous failure. And uh, to this day, which is what, 70 years almost, Israel is living off the success and suffering from the failure. Imagine if we had another, just for argument's sake, maybe another four or five million Jews in Israel. Oh my goodness, right? So uh, here we go. Zionism as a religious core comp what's that? Okay. Zionism as a religious core component of Judaism is a lot older, obviously. Just look at the, uh, at the sitter that we see all the time. Uh, Every time we do Musaf, we're only kicked out of our own country because of our sins. We're not able to do what we'd like to do, which is perform the temple service in Beis Amigdash. I don't know if you know what you're saying, we say it all the time. And therefore, you end up, rebuild the temple. Um, what does that mean? Scat gather in the scattered Jews among the Goyim, among the nations of the world. 
and get our dispersed ones from the ends of the earth. Yerushalayim based Migdash and so on and so forth. And the other prayers uh, along the same lines. So if you're talking about the sense of you want the Jewish people to go back to Israel, you say it all the time. Long before the modern movement existed, in this regard, in this specific regard, that no from Jew views the existence of Jewish people in exile as anything other than a Bedievis, as, as a second best, who was not a Zionist. Uh, the Rambam, for example, as you see over here, uh, didn't live in Israel. By the way, tried to make Aliyah like a lot of people. Uh, made Aliyah in the 1100s. Didn't work out financially. Had to move to Egypt. But he says, as part of his Ani Mamins, you believe as we all know, Bebe Yasa Mashiach, what does that mean? Define the word Mashiach. Somebody's going to lead the Jewish people back to Israel or lead the Jewish people in Israel. In other words, the Messianic idea of the Jewish people as classically interpreted by Maimonides and the Talmudists is one that only takes place in Israel. The Reformed Jewish movement, of course, in the 19th century redefined it. And they say you can have a Messianic movement in Charleston, <laughs> right? in St. Louis. You know the famous uh, speeches that were given long ago. But not in classical Judaism, and there are many others. Nevertheless, throughout Jewish history, until very recently, there was no movement. No such thing as Zionist movement. So this is a good question. Here you have Jews all over the place, hundreds of thousands, if not more, scattered everywhere, subscribing to a grand consensus from one end of the globe, wherever the Jews live, to the other, and not doing a single thing to bring it about. Uh, smart people, good businessmen, uh, if you're Maimonides, great visionaries, but it's never moving. It. Why? This is a historical question. Now, there are answers. During the old days, late antiquity, the Middle Ages, the early modern era, it was all the Jews could do to barely survive. Those conditions were very bad. And forget about organizing a movement to take Israel as beyond the pale. They didn't even know in the Middle Ages, you didn't know where, if, if tomorrow you're going to be alive. It would be a pogrom or, or, or a persecution, who knows? And that is true. And so, consequently, nobody could think in realistic political terms about organizing a movement of some sort to go and somehow reconquer or retake or claim Eretz Yisrael. It's not even up for discussion. Uh, I would even go for, and, and, and let me throw in that the pre-modern era was an era dominated by Christianity and Islam. Um, it's not possible in the Islamic world if there's a Jewish community today to say we're going to have a, a Jewish state in Israel. I mean, for example, I'm just comes to mind the Jews in Iran. There are 20,000 or something like Jews in Iran. They can't go around saying, you know, we want Eretz Yisrael. They can maybe say in some spiritual sense. But uh, that's not going to last for two minutes Islam. They'll kill them all. And that was a true in the Middle Ages in Christian countries as well. They'd be profoundly offended. If you remember, the Crusades were all about the Christians reclaiming Israel. You hear what I said? <laughs> the Christians reclaiming Palestine because the Muslims had taken it from the Christians back in the 600s. So we went back. What about the Jews? The Jews, forget it. It's not even for, for discussion. Internally speaking, the rabbis, who emerged as the authority figures in post-Temple Judaism, discouraged such movements. You hear what I said? If you ask the Rambam, people like they discouraged. They say, don't form any kind of movement like this for two basic reasons. Number one, it'll endanger the Jews by provoking, provoking the Gentiles. There were one or two people like David Alroy and others who wanted to make a Jewish army, all the rest of it. But what the person said back in, I don't know, the 700s, 800s, something like that, they said, if you Jews don't get rid of them, we'll kill all the Jews. <laughs> I said, they get rid of them. So anybody who's a messianic figure, really was a great danger to the Jewish people. And so the rabbis, therefore, looking to promote Jewish survival, always basically said, like, even the Rambam, who says, you have to believe everything come to Mashiach, but don't think about it. Just believe in it. Don't, uh, don't be from the Mechashvei Kitzim. Don't try to calculate when the Mashiach is coming or any of that kind of business, because it's very dangerous. Even though he violated that himself, but nevertheless. And the other reason is, since they usually are false starts, all the messiahs and would-be leaders turn out to be not the real thing. All that happens is 
you get people totally discouraged. So don't even bring it up in the first place. The Jews in the Middle Ages and afterwards were in a marathon race just to survive. You don't have time for this kind of business because daily life leads it that way. The most they could hope for would be that miraculously one day to wake up and the Mashiach will be here. Uh, that's the only way. Uh, most importantly, the most important reason, the total non-organization of the Jewish people. No state, no church. Uh, this is a remarkable aspect I always try to call attention to in my talks. Jewish people, for thousands of years now, or close to 2,000 years to be more exact, did not have a state and didn't try to, as I just pointed out. And they did not even have a church and they did not try to. Meaning that uh, long ago there was a Sanhedrin or something like that. There was some central authoritative legislative body within Judaism to which all the people are supposed to pay allegiance to and they can make laws. When you hear a drabonon, it means it goes back to the Sanhedrin ancient times. Uh, and therefore, once upon a time, there was some kind of group like that. They ran the calendar, legislated. Um, that's gone ever since the fourth century. And wherever Jews were, they were generally scattered from one community to another, far away from each other sometimes, closer to other times. And it wasn't even an attempt to say, let's all get together and organize a church of some kind, a, a, a body. There was once or twice a uh, almost comical attempt to reestablish Sanhedrin. It didn't go anywhere. And, uh, and it couldn't. And so the Jewish people always presented a funny reality. They're all over the place. They're kind of the same in many ways. There's a certain consensus that's pretty profound that uh, unites them. They have no organization whatsoever. There's the Jewish community in Rome. There's another Jewish community in Madrid or something like that. There's another one in Alexandria. There's another one in Jerusalem. There's another one in, 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 in Poland and Timbuktu. And each one does its own thing. And there's no inner connection politically or theologically in terms of a formal structure that uh, unites them. Uh, so this was a basic feature of the Jewish people. Uh, you might view this as a brilliant instrument of survival, and that argument can be made, or not. Uh, I think some will remember a number of years ago when I, for my mother's yard site I did about Gracia Mendes. Remember her up there? And uh, what did she try to do? Well, when the Pope at that time in the 1550s uh, broke his word and arrested the Muranos that were located in Ancona in Italy, and uh, burn them at the stake. She said, let's play hardball and deal with the Pope in the only language he understands. Let's all the Jewish communities organize a boycott of the Pope's country, the Papal States. Now, him in the pocketbook, and that'll bring him to his knees. And take it from me, you know, she was a famous businesswoman, a uh, zillionaire, and she said, uh, you know, I know, I know what talks in this world. It didn't happen, because the Jewish community is going to get together and agree on it. Some said it's a good idea, some said a bad idea, it'll endanger other Jews, and so on and so forth. No, it, was, it was a grand failure. And it simply is a dramatic example of what was the Jewish reality all the time. It's no state, it's no organization, no nothing. It's just Jews. <laughs> you get it? It's just Jews. The most you had was the local kahila, and that's it. Um, the greatest example of a trans kahila government was the four Vada Baratzas, the four the Council of the Four Lands uh, that used to meet in Poland from the different parts of Poland. Big deal. What did you get together? Organize how much taxes should be paid, put a harem here or there, allow somebody, allow somebody to, make, to publish a book. No, this is a very weak uh, example of what a government is, and it wasn't really. And that's as close as you got. That's pretty painful. That's as close as you got. And so the Jewish people, basically, under the old order, were in a world in which it was unthinkable for Jews to organize politically. Political helplessness, political helplessness was a core component of traditional Judaism. I'm modifying the usual template of four that I put up there. And let's go to the next one there. You look over here. This fundamentalism, nominism, you'll remember this, autonomous, coercive, kilos, coalition, and celerity, and political and military impotence. And I don't mean it to be funny. The reason a pope would allow Jews to live in Rome, the reason any ruler anywhere, a prince, a caliph, a duchess, 
uh, a king, an emperor, or any of that stuff. What Atlantic Jew is in is, is no threat. They're, they're politically impotent. They're militarily impotent. Anytime I want to, I can kill them. Anytime I want to, I can throw them out, which was true. And that, the Jews had to turn into a plus, as the best they could. Let us in your country and let us live here. After all, we are the opposite of a threat. We have no power whatsoever. Okay? And that's why, as you see in the next uh, 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 screen here, uh, as I always point out, wherever Jews lived, in pre-modern times it was, as you see here, on sufferance and of service. What does that mean? It's your house. You're just letting me live in your house. You can kick me out whenever you want. And of course they did from time to time, didn't they? And the Jews never had any complaints about it in the formal sense because it's not the Jewish house. When they, for example, expelled the Jews from Spain in 1492, what could you say? You couldn't say you don't have the right to do it. You got the right to do it. The only thing you do is beg. So you're on sufferance and of service. Let me live in your country because it'll be good for your money. Somehow or other. Good for the economy. So as I said before, the Jews had no choice but to try to turn their impotence into a plus. What else can you do? But that was a basic feature of what Judaism is. They're simply waiting for a miraculous change in that reality. But other than that, you can't do anything about it. Uh, and then, as we get closer to the modern period, things started to change slowly. The Christians, at least, not the Muslims, started to rethink their attitudes towards the political status of the Jews and towards religious persecution in principle. This was a big sea change in the history of Western civilization. When you start to have people, that's pretty late in history. You're talking about the 1600s, 1700s. You had John Locke in England and uh, Voltaire and people like that saying, gee, maybe coercion and discrimination legally against people on the basis of their personal beliefs is not such a great idea. Uh, this is a radical idea. After all, Judaism preaches coercion and persecution of people based on their beliefs. Does it not say in the Old Testament, if you worship an idol, I'll kill you? Right? Well, what's your problem? I want to worship an idol. Get off my back. You see? You're Michal Shabbos, I'll stone you. Don't tell me what to do in Shabbos. Yeah. But, but, but it's not written like that. And so coercion was a basic and fundamental feature of all the three monotheistic religions. Judaism, I'll say it again. Christianity and Islam. Uh, Judaism was sort of deprived of the opportunity to apply coercion, not that they abandoned it. Uh, Islam still maintains it today, as we all know. It's what you call Sharia law, isn't that right? And, uh, and if they can, they'll apply it in Europe, one, two, three. And, uh, and Christianity is the only one that changed. At least, let's put it this way, some did. And this is what you call the Enlightenment. Okay? So when people started to say, gee, let's rethink some of our first principles, including, as I say before, rel religious uh, coercion and therefore it spills off into how you treat the Jews, that's something that's rel relatively recent and nobody had in mind the state of Israel but it set off little by little a chain of events that led to that even though it was impossible to foretell and then once the non-Jews did it, the Jews started to uh, raise the issue a little bit and Moses Mendelssohn Got, who was a very smart guy, he got his Christian friend, Christian Wilhelm Dohm, who was a Prussian uh, bureaucrat. He was like number three in the Treasury Department under Frederick the Great. He said, you're a guy, you write the book. <laughs> it had more, more effect. Burglar, Lisha, Verbesserung, der Juden. Civic upgrade for the Jews. God forbid, not civil rights. We don't want civil rights for the Jews. That's too much. But how about a little bit of upgrade? You understand? Not such a bad persecution, uh, make the ghetto a little bit wider, as we say today, you know, cut the taxes from 90% to 85 That's all we're talking about. Uh, but as a sea change, that for the first time, people are talking about bettering the situation of the Jews on, on, on some basis or another. And of course, not long after that, in a quite unexpected fashion, the French Revolution broke out. Uh, Mendelssohn and, and, and Dohm wrote the book in 1779, Ten years later was the French Revolution, which was unexpected. And one of the features of the French Revolution, rather unexpected, I might add, was the civil rights for the Jews. That's not the only item of the French Revolution. They had a lot more than that. But it was one of the items. So once they finished chopping off this one's head and that one's head and confiscating this estate and burning down that church 
and uh, you know, uh, slaughtering the peasants in Devonte and things like that. Now, what's the Tzuchem the Yidden? You know, saying what? How about the Jews? And that's what happened in 1790, and in 1791, eventually they got around to that issue. Um, again, this was completely unexpected, but the people who created the French Revolution and in the the new France that emerged that French Revolution were atheists, the majority, and therefore they were interested in redefining, reinventing the very notion of a state. And until then, a state was a Christian entity. Uh, I'll give you an example. England, till this day, is a, formerly a Christian entity. They don't bother anybody. But the, as you know, I don't have to tell you, the Queen of England is the head of the Church of England. Uh, they have no problem with that. But in France, back in 1790, they did for various reasons. And therefore, they said from now on, a state is a completely secular concept. And if that's so, then we have to ask ourselves the following question. On what basis do we discriminate against people who have different beliefs about God? Or no belief whatsoever? Is that the business of the state? And how can it do that? And they didn't like the Jews, they didn't want to do it, but they were forced at the end through a pro process of logical um, thinking to come up with the idea that they had to give the Jews in France civil rights, and that's brand new in history. So Jews getting formal legal rights as citizens to live wherever they want and to pay the same tax as everybody else, not more, and to go to a school and engage in a business the way they want, that's uh, with the French Revolution. Okay? That's the French Revolution. Let me throw in, there was a quid pro quo. It wasn't explicit, but it was pretty doggone implicit. And the quid pro quo is you have to give up a certain amount of Judaism in order to qualify for French citizenship. They never exactly spelled out how much. They left it to the imagination. Some Jews had a heavy imagination. Some Jews had a less heavy imagination. And that's how it turned out. Okay? So um, it's not the United States of America. Uh, there were only 2,500 Jews in this country at the uh, time of George Washington. There weren't any Jews here. Uh, but it's uh, Europe. And Europe is not simply in modern way, you know, you, we give you uh, civil rights and full equality just because you're a person, but was uh, you Jews are a separate tribe. What are you going to do to show that you're worthy of this? Now, this happened in, in France, uh, and I don't want to go now that the time precludes. The French in the following 20 some years. By bayonet point, because uh, Napoleon uh, conquered Europe and shoved it down the throats of the European countries, but then they kicked out Napoleon and went back to square one as much as they could. And uh, after 1815, they took away all the civil rights from everybody, except in France. And uh, there was then a civil rights struggle of the Jews from 1815 to 1870, uh, where little by little, again, kicking and screaming, the different countries in Europe who did not want to do it did end up, for one reason or another, uh, giving the Jews uh, civil rights. Even England, which was actually very liberal for the Jews ever since Oliver Cromwell. There's no, no complaints against the English in that regard. Uh, but they always did it off the books illegally. Uh, according to uh, English law, there were no Jews in England. That's the reason there were no anti-Jewish laws. There aren't any Jews here. Uh, with, no, Oliver Cromwell set up a policy of don't ask, don't tell. And Charles II after him kept it up. And uh, there weren't many Jews anyway, four or five thousand, it didn't matter. And uh, still, uh, even in the country, um, my point is like this, if this is true about England, Karl Bechomer, Germany and Austria and these other places, in a country even like England, which really was uh, uh, very liberal, and I would even say philo-Semitic, not anti-Semitic, philo-Semitic, they really were disturbed by the notion of a Jew wanting complete and total civil rights, and that he should be a member of parliament and get to vote and things like this. Here's a piece from, uh, from online from, from uh, some uh, uh, miniseries where you'll see uh, in England in 1859, it's very late, 1859, a year before Abraham Lincoln, Rothschild is elected, as had been the case a number of times, by Wall Street, by the City of London, visiting to be a member of Parliament. No, he won fair and square, but each time he went to take the oath of office, as you'll see in a second, uh, they would say no, because... Uh, it's a Christian thing, you have to take the oath of office on the true faith of a Christian, and since you can't and won't, and why should you, then you can't be a member of parliament even though it was elected. Uh, and then you'll see Disraeli over here, who was Jewish, who had converted to Christianity at the age of 13. So he was a Christian, otherwise he wouldn't have had a career. You hear what I said? Disraeli would not have been in parliament 
and risen had he been a Jew. But on the other hand, he was a Jew. So he made a famous speech and where he said, this is not right. So in other words, he said like this, listen, I know that Christianity is true, and thank God I've come to see the truth and all the rest of it, but, no, so in other words, I'm legit, but it's not fair to exclude the Jews from the polity and from the parliament, and I'm just going to show you this because it's dramatic, but my point's like this. Just multiply this across Prussia and Austria and Hungary and Italy and all the other countries, and you'll see what a difficult process it was. Here, take a look. This is the parliament in 1859. That's Rothschild. <laughs> See, put put a yarmulke on. withdraw. That's the Israeli. So you get the idea. It was a hot topic once upon a time. Now, a, a, a little, a little while after this, they changed the law. Okay, I won't go into the details. So, if that's true of England, you see that getting the civil rights in the full sense. Uh, now, let's let's put it this way: you can't exactly say Lord Rothschild was suffering <laughs> a tough life in England. I mean, you know, a it's a bummer to be a billionaire and can't vote for office. You know, but uh, uh, nevertheless, there was a strong feeling. Uh, that this is a Christian country, and uh, it's offensive to the national ethos to uh, bring in uh, some an outsider. But they changed. But as I pointed out, civil rights in all these countries came at the cost of assimilation. And then you had the unintended consequences, which is always the rule in history, because the Jews assimilate, but when they assimilate, they become not only consumers of European culture, but also producers of it. So you start to have a say and power, if you wish, in the uh, general society. Before 1800, read about European culture. There are no Jews. The painters, the writers, the poets, the philosophers, the artists. It's all Christian. The Jews are doing their own thing. Now, the Jews say like this, we have the Pnei Yeshua, you know, we have, the we have our own culture. No question about that. No question about that. But the two cultures don't meet. Now they do. Um, and for the first time, the Europeans run across the very uncomfortable phenomenon of what they regard as Jewish power. Jews never had power. Now, what kind of power do you have over here? Well, first of all, there's Rothschild, and there's the Pope and the others kissing his feet. You understand? Know, it's famous cartoons. Money power. 
Um, after all, all the Jews are rich, and Rothschild certainly is, is a zillionaire, and all the countries had to borrow money from him, which is true. And therefore, uh, governments rise and fall, and wars are made because of Rothschild and people like that. So all of a sudden, something you never had in 1700s, 1600s, 1500s, and all the rest of it, is the financial power. Uh, number two, the uh, internet of the 19th century, uh, journalism, correct? Mass newspapers, never existed before. So the same impact in your life and my life, the end up with the impact, that was the radical new impact of what we call daily newspapers. And who are the owners of a good deal of the famous newspaper chains in Europe? The Jews, uh, either unconverted Jews or converted Jews, Osteen, and, uh, you know, Adolf Fox's New York Times, for example, and Moss, these are, uh, these are just three. I mean, I don't have room in the, on the slide for 100 picked names, but you could do it. And uh, not in England, by the way, which is interesting, but uh, yes, in France, yes, in Germany, yes, in Austria, uh, yeah, and yes, in many other countries. And you know how it goes. If you control the newspaper, it's like uh, controlling, what's the right word today? Facebook or one of these things, right? And so the Jews now have power because... The newspapers make and break the politicians. They can heat up the public and mold them to whatever way they want. And it's all Jewish plot. Uh, politics. Uh, didn't we just see over here? Uh, the Israeli, who they regard as Jewish. I mean, I know I'm, they were quite aware that he was technically a Christian and all the rest of it, which he was. And by the way, let me make this point. As far as I'm aware, the Israeli was a believing Christian. You know what I'm saying? He really bought the whole show, not, uh, uh, the whole business. He nevertheless had a soft spot for his Jewish background. That's, that's all. Okay? And so uh, the Israeli, uh, if he rises in this un unbelievable the prime minister of England, of the British Empire, in time of Queen Victoria, when he's uh, not from the aristocracy, he's not from the right family background, uh, he's not a landowner, you know, he's totally from the wrong origins. And nevertheless, through sheer politicking and ability, he rises to the top of the conservative party, not the liberal party, <laughs> of the conservative party. Uh, as they used to say, the conservative run by the, by the jockey and the Jew, Lord Darby from the Derby, you know, and, 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 and Israeli. So what does that mean? Uh, that's a radical example, and I'll show you in a second, of the fact that in the 19th century, Jews all over Europe, outside of Russia, do enter the cabinets, the parliaments, there are Jewish ministers in the cabinets in, in many countries uh, by the second half of the 1800s. If you're a Christian and you don't like that, this is terrible. You understand? Because they're not representing the regular people, representing their own group or something like that. That's how you see it. And so I'll tell you again, every finance minister or something like that, the, the head guy or the deputy guy was Jewish. Uh, and what is that? We don't like, this was not the plan. The plan was they should stay a marginal little minority, just not be so persecuted. We didn't realize when we let go, that the genie might uh, jump out of the box. Uh, here, take a look at this. By the Suez Canal, the 177,000 shares owned by the Khadib is then a certainty of sale. After years of colossal extravagance, he's made his country almost totally bankrupt. Uh, Adrian Cairo tells us he has given an option on his shares
a controlling agent. He's too big a step. If we do not buy it now, one day we shall be forced to take it. Nothing is more certain. If the French are allowed to buy the share, they will have a majority. Howard, stop it just for a second. Can you? Are you able to? The guy with the beard talking to the Israeli is, uh, became Lord Salisbury. His nephew, Arthur Balfour. <laughs> Later on comes First World War. He's talking about the territory next to the Suez Canal. <coughs> the British Shalom works in funny ways. Hey, let, let's, let's finish the story. Are you able to finish the story? We'll try it. Go. All right. yeah. You have to go through it again. Then we won't. Uh, we won't do it. It's a, it's a shame because very quickly what happened was they had to come up with the money. One, two, three. The uh, government wasn't open. The banks weren't open, and so he went to Rothschild. And it's like this. He says, "I need the money now." <laughs> he says, "Okay." You know, and that's how England got the Suez Canal. Now here's my point. This is pro-British, so. You say, oh, it's a good thing the Jews were in the right place right on our side. What if you're not British? How come the French didn't get the Suez Canal? Damn Jews. What do the Germans say? What do the Italians say? What do the Turks say? Is it, well, sure, the Israeli, you know, Rothschild. I mean, what's there to talk about? <laughs> you get it? So in other words, notions of power are fed by contemporary events if they're interpreted in a certain way. Now, you know and I know it's not true that all Jews in the world got together and said, gee, Let's figure out how we can give England the Suez Canal. You live. But others believe that. Okay? And I can guarantee you, to this day, if you want it on a TV show in Al Jazeera, you know, or, or in, in uh, what am I thinking of? The, on, uh, online with the Arab, uh, the memory, yeah, and all the, you know, what they get from the Arab TV shows, uh, Egypt. Oh, sure, I mean, the Suez Canal, the Jews bought it off, you know, one, two, three. They got a bargain, too. They, they beat out the French price. Israeli, you know, Rothschild, you know, of course, you see? So these are all notions of, um, of political power. Uh, so you have journalistic power, you have financial power, you have uh, political power over here, and uh, even the United States of America, uh, where there weren't that many Jews, but there were a quarter million by the time you finished the Civil War. Ulysses S. Grant, I think everybody knows this now because they've written books recently about it, when he ran for President of the United States, he had to deny and sort of half apologize for having kicked the Jews out of the South in the Department of the Mississippi in 1862. I think most of you know what I'm talking about. And he said, it didn't happen. Another guy wrote the letter. It wasn't me. Why did he do that? Jewish vote. Jewish vote? 1868? Yes. How big of a Jewish vote in 1868? Well, if it's a, like, like Trump election, if it's a close call and the state is decided by 3,000 votes, which often happened, then if you have a block of 5, 10, 15,000 votes, it can make a difference. And they're not going to vote for an anti-Semit like Grant, as it was seen at that time, unless he said, it wasn't true, you know, it's not the, what's the right word, taken out of context, famous line. And uh, <laughs> so anyhow, that's what happened. Uh, and finally, uh, perhaps even the most, the Jews have a power in increasing uh, tempo in culture and science. And culture and science was the spear of European culture. How did Europe surge ahead of everybody else? The West. Why did Europe leave Africa, Asia, all those places way back? Because Europe had a scientific revolution. And who's at the head of the scientific revolution? As you know, I mean, there's plenty of non-Jews, right? But there's plenty of Jews. Uh, who are the great names in secular European Western culture? In the second half of the 19th century, need I point to Karl Marx and Freud and Einstein a little bit later, and in, in uh, literature, who's the German writer of the 19th century, Heinrich Heine, and uh, I give you other names, Bertolt Auerbach, and uh, Proust, and people like that. I mean, what the heck is going on over here? A few years ago, you never heard of these Jews. Not that long ago, in my grandfather's time, they were in a ghetto, talking Yiddish. Where did this happen? And by the way, Every one of these guys, I mean, Einstein, Freud, 
Marts, if you went two, three generations back, they were Abonim, Taka Yiddish, it was in a ghetto somewhere. I mean, they really were. Go take the trouble to look it up. Uh, Freud's father, uh, God help us, was a Galtianer, you know? So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm serious. You know? <laughs> what are you going to do? Now, uh, the Gentiles, therefore, were uneasy with Jewish power in any form because this was brand new. Uh, one manifestation of this unease, as you and I know, is the notion of a grand, vast Jewish conspiracy, a secret Jewish union, the Protocols of the Elder Zion, just the, just the manifestation of that. But even if it wasn't this particular document, these kind of notions are universally held. You hear what I said? Universally held. I mean, that's quite a statement I made. Among the elites of Europe, these are educated people. Uh, they, quote unquote, should know better, but they don't. Because there's what you learn here and there's what you learn here. And what you learn over here is, you know, the Jews, you know, you know that thing, they're all together, it's whatever, you know, like that. Do you really believe that? No, yeah, yeah, no, no, yes, somewhere, somewhere. Okay? I mean, Bismarck, Franz Josef, Queen Victoria, <laughs> you know, people like that, at, at the top of the pile. And the reality, however, I'm sorry to say, is there was zero Jewish power, zero solidarity, zero solidarity, as Gracia Mendes demonstrated. And uh, all you had was Stadlonus. Stadlonut means you had someone go lobby on behalf of the poor suffering Jews, appeal to uh, liberal sentiment if you can find it. The Montefiore is the, as you see on the pictures here, classic manifestation of this 19th century. Who is Montefiore? A wealthy British Jew who just went all over the place wherever he could to try to help Jews. How could he help the Jews? He didn't have an army. He didn't have anything behind him. It's what you call the power of publicity. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't work. Last year, two years ago in the summer, he went to the Damascus affair. There it worked. Other times he went to when they kidnapped that kid Mortara, the Pope, and he went, but it didn't work. You know, see, because he had nothing behind him other than public sentiment. So all you have is, I say, Stadlonis. And Montefiore didn't bribe people. Usually, the old-fashioned ways, you try to pay somebody off. Okay, let's go to the next slide. What was the slogan of, Shla of the Stadlon? Sorry, the most one and all. It says in the Gemara that the gates of tears are never closed in heaven. But the Stadlon always says the gates of money are never closed in heaven. Sorry, the most. You understand? So this is a manifestation of helplessness. If that's what you got to do, you have no power. But the others say, oh, the Jews are, look at the Israeli, look at Rothschild. Oh, right. Yeah, I'm the Israeli. Ich bin Rothschild, halava, you know? Now, um, therefore, as I said before, it was a very difficult process of civil rights. And perhaps the main unspoken quid pro quo was that if you want to be part of our nation, you have to renounce your own nationhood. Uh, in Germany, they were particular about this. Uh, all throughout the civil rights struggle between 1850 and 1870, and it took that long, the Germans informally and sometimes in pamphlets said, like why, 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 why do you want to say you want to be part of Germany? You're not. Don't you say in your davening you want to go back to Jerusalem and all that? I mean, let's be honest. You know, cut the baloney. You're, you're not really German. Seriously, you're not German. You're, you're Jews have li living over here. And the Jews who desperately wanted civil rights had to twist like a pretzel. No, oh, we really... Our German, that's only Yerushalayim and some future in the Messianic era when God will come down in a cloud in heaven and we don't mean over here. I mean, people like Seyus Rafael Hirsch and others. You get it? Some Jews, as you know, like the Reform Movement said, you know, they're absolutely right, so let's chuck it. And they changed the sitter. Many other Jews became secular and they said, forget, I don't want to have nothing to do with anything Jewish whatsoever. I ain't Jewish. If you go all the way, like Heinrich Heine, you convert to Christianity. Not because you believe in Christianity, because you want to show that you have no. Jewish nationhood, you see? Uh, if you're still you want to be a Jew, then what you have to, even an Orthodox Jew, what you have to say is like this, I am a Shomer Shabbos, but I have helped Germany in this way, that way, the third way, and the fourth way. You understand? I've helped German society because I am a good doctor, or I've made a discovery, or somehow or other I advanced the national cause, you know, something like that. Uh, so the idea is you have to give up on your nationhood. And the Jews did agree to this quid pro quo because they wanted to get it. Uh, nobody wants to live in a ghetto. Nobody wants to live in a terrible condition like used to be the only one person in the family can get married. In order to get regular rights, to, to, to live like a human being, they're willing to do it. Now, as you see over here, the Chassam Sofer uh, was all against that. And he said, you're giving up your uh, 
birthright for a mess of porridge like Esau. Correct? How can Jews do this? Uh, don't you have any pride? But yeah, he was a lone voice. Get another, yeah, Rabbi, okay, fine, it's a good speech. Now, but, but let's get real. You know, I want my son to be CPA. Uh, I'm, I'm serious. The Chassam Sover has a very famous speech in which he said, I've, I've quoted before, in which he's against emancipation. And he put it in the old fashioned rabbinic style in which he said, Once upon a time, my friends, there was a king, and he had a son. And the king became estranged from the son and who was exiled to a distant island. And the son, on that distant island, is pining away. He wants to return back to see his father. And time goes by, months and years go by, and he's becoming more and more desirous of ending his period on the island and going back to see his father. And one day, like Robinson Crusoe, he looks out from the spyglass and he sees a whole fleet of ships coming. And he says, good, my father is sending me a fleet of ships to take me back to home. But then it turns out when the ships show up, it's a bunch of ships that the father sent to build him a gigantic palace on the island. So what's the problem? Now he lived like a prince on the island. I don't want to live on the island. I want to go back to see my father. You understand the muscle, correct? So uh, that's a voice in the wilderness, what I just said before. Now, uh, so the Jews were m made the, the, the choice. Now, the irony is in Europe, and perhaps I shouldn't say irony because we're living in the year 2017. If I gave this speech 20 years ago, it would be an irony. Unfortunately, current reality in Europe is what it is. Uh, but the irony was, once the Jews got civil rights, that led to anti-Semitism. The modern movement of anti-Semitism starts in the 1870s, immediately after the Jews secured civil rights and the last holdouts. And uh, what can I tell you? Anti-Semitism becomes a movement. You get what I'm saying? In Germany and Austria, there were parties, and the title of the parties is the Anti-Semitic Party. <laughs> now, I, I assure you, and mainly in Hesse and places like that, there were people elected to the German parliament and to the Austrian parliament not the liberals, not the conservatives, not the Catholics. It's the anti-Semite party. That's the name of the party. Okay? And uh, for a while they did okay. And uh, wow. <laughs> what does that mean? A lot of people say a big mistake was made when they freed the Jews. It's getting out of hand. And so here you see one of the most famous of these political figures, Karl Luger, who was an uh, Austrian politician, was elected, re-elected, re-elected the mayor of Vienna on the anti-Semite party. And Vienna, the big Jewish community, that's exactly why all the non-Jews voted for him. And uh, I can tell you this, the Emperor Franz Josef was uh, horrified. And when he was elected, he says, I do not confirm him as mayor. And so he had another election. He said, I still don't confirm him as mayor. And they got a third election, and he said, well, they have no choice. You get it? And this guy was, believe it or not, not so bad, because he was fortunately a demagogue. So he really did, he had Jewish friends, so he just used that as a shtick. But it's not that far away from Hitler, who growing up is enamored of Karl Luger and sees him as a, and by the way, he was an excellent mayor. When I say excellent mayor, he fixed up the communal servi uh, community services, the, the hygiene, uh, did a lot for the city, and for the Jewish community, did not suffer under him at all. But nevertheless, the point was made, I was elected on the anti-Semite platform. So you Jews, Know your place. Okay. So this is kind of interesting. Now, the Jews are shocked, and they don't know what to do, what to say. Like today. I mean, what is today in Europe, for example? Maybe it's coming to America, maybe it's not. I hope it's not, but it might be. But in Europe it is. What do you respond if you live today in England, in France, in Germany, in all those other places today, when you have the rising anti what, what What's the solution? So, uh, because Europe was not turning out as they imagined it would be. They thought in their youth, once we get civil rights, it'll be, uh, you know, paradise. Sort of like what America's been for in, in, in our lifetime, thank God. They never got that over in Europe. And so what's going to happen? And so, you'll be surprised to hear that when there's more than one Jew, there was more than one reaction. The liberal Jews, the liberal Jews said, this too shall pass. It's, it's a hiccup. It's, it's a bump on the road. Two steps forward, one step backwards. You know, the public's a little dumb still, but don't worry, as time goes on, true liberalism will reassert itself. Reason will win out. Okay. Uh, the socialist Jews, they said, well, let's follow Karl Marx. Karl Marx said like this, it'll never change. It's an anti-Semitism, a very basic feature of society. 
unless you rip society up by the roots and shoot everybody and totally reorganize it from top to bottom. And then if you do it on a Marxist basis, then there won't be any anti-Semitism because there won't be any Judaism. There won't be any Jews because there won't be any Christianity. Because we all know religion is the opiate of the masses. And consequently, once you get rid of religion, obviously, I can't be against you because you have a different faith. Nobody has any faith. That was the Marxist notion. And how many Jews then and today have been sympathizers with Marxist ideas? Uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you ever had a relative in the 20th century who was a Marxist. But if anybody leaves his hand down, you're a liar. <laughs> now, uh, but that's the reason they were. Because they bought into and they said, it'll be a utopia. Once you completely destroy the current society and replace it with a better society, and many Jews say like this, you live in Europe, they say that's the only solution because this won't go away any other way. Uh, so those are the socialist solutions to anti-Semitism. A third solution that will emerge in reaction to this outbreak of anti-Semitism after the Jews get civil rights will be Herzlian Zionism. That's what it is. See, the Herzl emerged in the context of the anti-Semitic reaction, especially where, where, where did he grow up in Vienna? Who was the mayor? Luger. He says, uh, see, Herzl's uh, whole idea is that he came up with precisely within this context, that European anti-Semitism is a bummer, and according to him, it ain't going away, and therefore I have a different solution. Let us get the heck out of here. That's what it is. You ain't going to change them. Now Herzl, as we all know, maybe you don't know, came from a very interesting background. His grandparents have been religious, the parents were not religious, which is very common at that time. Uh, he had a completely secular upbringing. But you can't grow up in Vienna and go to school and go to college without being aware that you're Jewish, because they'll beat you up. Or they have all kinds of discrimination. Vienna is not the Cincinnati or something like that. You know what I mean? It's uh, the cutting edge. So you know you're Jewish. Now, Herzl, in spite of what I just said, uh, made a career for himself. He got a PhD in law, and then he went into journalism, which was a good, good uh, business. Like, it's like today going on to the internet business. And uh, he rose to the top. He was like Ted Koppel or something like that. He uh, was, was the Paris correspondent for the Vienna newspaper, if you understand what I'm saying. That's a, that's a plump position, correct? Like today, for example, being the White House correspondent for a major news uh, outlet. He, he had a nice situation going on over there. And personally speaking, he made it. Uh, his wife was Jewish, but they had no, you know, they had a Christmas tree. They had, he had no uh, connection with Judaism, except for a very profound knowledge of anti-Semitism, because you can't, you can't avoid it. So for the first 30 years of his life, he did what everybody else did, which is try to ignore it as much as possible, and build your own life and your own career. But, but it ate away at him. And uh, he came to the conclusion, he knew a lot of non-Jews. Uh, this is the world in which he operated. I'll say it again. He was the Paris correspondent, meaning he covered the French parliament. He actually wrote a book called Secrets of the Palais Bourbon. You know? <laughs> he says, uh, you know, one of these uh, politics books that people will write if you're a journalist. And um, so he knew the French very well. He knew the Austrians very well. He knew the Germans well. And he himself was a Hungarian. So how much more European can you get? And his conclusion, when he was in his 30s, was get over it, anti-Semitism is not going away, it never will. That's a different perspective. The socialists say we can make it go away with socialism. The liberals say it'll go away on its own through enlightenment. Right? He says, you're all wrong, you're, you're, you're in La La Land. Europe at least, at least Europe, will never change. And, and the reason is very simple. We Jews are obnoxious, we cause anti-Semitism. This is what he says. Let, let's cut the baloney, let's talk real, and not the PC. That's exactly the point of his book, right? I'm not going to re re resort to circumlocutions and polite statements and all the rest of it. I know the theories just like everybody else. He's, highly, he's a PhD. He's highly educated. And I also know what the, 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 the shoemaker, I know the, the bus driver in the street. I know people who are not Jewish. It'll never go away. And I understand why. We're like that, most of us. And uh, his conclusion, therefore, was sooner or later a Hitler was going to rise. This ain't good. Uh, and the only solution is to set up a Jewish state where the Jews can go before that happens. Now, he couldn't imagine Hitler exactly, but he meant somebody like this, but worse. So he did imagine Hitler. You understand what I mean? Now, it's not Adolf Hitler specifically, but he foresaw that something's going to happen. Because he knew the waiter at the restaurant and the uh, 
ticket taker on the subway train and the you know uh, official that you go to get your license they'll vote for Hitler they'll have no trouble with it he could tell that and what are we doing and as far as he's concerned the liberals and all who just pretend it's not going to happen are, are, are in denial it's a suicide and so we got to do something to get out of here uh, in other words he regarded himself as an eminent student of the Gentile mind and he was and to be perfectly honest he had more to do with non-Jews than the average Jew that was his nature of his business you know of his, uh, of his profession and so he said like this is you guys are dumb you don't know what it is I know these people and uh, consequently, in 1835, when he's 35 years old, 1895, he wrote his famous uh, pamphlet called the uh, Judenstaat, which means State of the Jews. Uh, it doesn't mean a Jewish state, but it means a state with Jews in it. In which, obviously, he said these radical ideas that I just said. It says anti semitism never going away. We cause it. Let, let's look at the next uh, uh, excerpt over here. This is just a little piece of it, what he writes in there. After centuries of various restrictions, hostilities, and pogroms, the Jews of Europe have been reduced to living in ghettos. The higher class, he means today, in 1895, after civil rights, we're still living in ghettos. The higher class is forced to deal with angry mobs and so experience a great deal of discomfort. So even if you're Rothschild, you know everybody hates you. The lower class lives in despair. The average Jewish guy, the butcher, the baker, the the maker, is talk up the creek because the money doesn't have and anti-Semitism he has to deal with and life stinks. The middle class professionals are distrusted and the statement do buy from Jews caused much anxiety among Jewish people. That was the slogan of the anti-Semitic party of Karl Luger, don't buy from Jews. Okay. Uh, it, is, it is reasonable to assume the Jews will not be left in peace, which means it ain't going away. Neither a change in the feeling of non-Jews nor a movement to merge in the surrounding of Europe offers much hope to the Jewish people. So don't think you can assimilate better. Greater assimilation won't do the trick, uh, which was profoundly offensive to many Jews. The Jewish question, he says, persists wherever Jews live in appreciable numbers. So as I tell you, you're obnoxious. So therefore, is one Jew in the neighborhood, Mela. You know, even Roland Park can handle one. One. Okay? But it's more than that. Wherever it doesn't exist, it's brought, it is brought in with Jewish immigrants. So wherever, if the Jews went away, as they did from Russia to America, they bring out them to America. If they run away to Argentina, you bring up to Argentina. Because that's who we are. We are naturally drawn to those places where we're not persecuted. And then our appearance gives rise to persecution. Okay? This is the case, and will inevitably be so, everywhere. Even a highly civilized country like France. As long as the Jewish question is not solved on a political level. I can't tell you how offensive this was to the liberal mentality. It was today the associate would have him shot. You understand? The Jewish, the Jewish federations, or the equivalent thereof of 1895, you're not allowed to say this, you're giving uh, uh, ammunition to the enemy, you know, you're doing all the wrong things, and he said, who is going to say the emperor has no clothes? Who's going to do that? Okay, nobody, the responsible people are not doing it, so somebody has to do it. Whew. So, but this is only a small piece. It's a pamphlet. Uh, a fairly, uh, it's not a small pamphlet either. And the key point is, and by the way, I want to point out something. Theodor Herzl was a liberal. Like today, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this to be funny. He says, Theodor Herzl, if he was around today, he'd be like a Hillary voter. Maybe not Bernie, but a Hillary, for sure. He would definitely not be a Republican. Okay? So he wasn't, no, 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 I'm just telling you where he's coming from. This is not some right-wing, extreme guy. Mainstream fellow, PhD, successful journalist, had a very popular newspaper column See if we made a good living, and so on and so forth, like like you you know like these these columnists that you see today, or yesterday, and uh, he had a life, and if he wanted to, he could go through life without having to deal with all these issues because he personally was fairly insulated from all this. You get it? He could do it, but that's not who he was. And he said, I don't see it going in the right direction, and therefore I have to call a spade a spade. And the solution that I'm offering, he says, goes like this. We don't want to be thieves in the night. We don't want to steal something. We want you, the Gentiles out there, to recognize the cogency of my argument and help me solve the problem. You don't want us living among you. We, it's not good for us to live among you. Let's be civilized about this. You don't need a Hitler kind of business. Give us a country and come on you. 
He, and by the way, he's a liberal. He doesn't say every Jew has to leave. He probably himself wouldn't go. He says there's a Jew, but there are plenty to do. You know, whoever wants to stay behind can do. Uh, I repeat for the fifth time. He was a liberal. He was in favor of the Africans against the colonialists, to give you an example. You know, he's in favor of the Indians against the cowboys. He was a liberal guy. No, no, I, I, I do mean that. I, I, I'm serious. He was, he was, in his politics, was liberal. But he said like this: the Jewish question is different. It doesn't conform to the usual conservative liberal stuff. The Jews are just a funny business, and therefore we have to deal with it this way. And so we want a legal, I emphasize the word legal, upfront uh, state that the world at that time, there wasn't a United Nation, but the European nation which ruled the world should agree to uh, on a, as I say before, on a liberal, logical basis. And he wrote a book later on to describe it in a, in a uh, what should I say, a novel form. And I'll just tell you how, how it goes very simply. This could have happened. It didn't, of course, but it could have happened. Could have been 1895. The British, the Russians, the Germans, and the uh, others said, you know, the guy's right. Let's go to Turkey and say, get the heck out of Palestine. And we'll declare war on you. Right? And because we've got to get the Jews <laughs> out of here somewhere. And, okay, you Jews, now you take over. And bring in five, six million people. Get them out of Poland. Get them out of Russia. Get them out of Hungary. And, all, and, and be frank, get them out of Germany, too, except the rich ones. You know? And go and have your own country and give them to hate. And, he's like, and what's wrong with that? No, what is wrong with what I just said? That's how Herzl would put it. You get it? Now, uh, the key point was how you make it work. It's good in a novel form. It's good, like I said before, an imaginary form. How you make it work. First of all, you need a lot of money. So he went to Rothschild. Because he's like, you have unlimited uh, ch uh, checkbook. There's Rothschild up there, Edmund Rothschild in Paris, who was unknown to Herzl, perhaps, when it was actually bankrolling the early Jewish settlements in Palestine before Herzl even discovered that there was an Eretz Yisrael. The guy was very assimilated. Rothschild was paying money for Zichron Yaakov, Benjamin, and these other places back in the 1880s, early 1890s. And Rothschild came from a very different point of view. Shut up, don't talk about it. Little by little, we'll buy up the whole country and come out. That's a Rothschild, that's who he was. So he didn't like Herzl, but Herzl was like this. Let's go up front, no fooling around. And all I need is $10 billion, <laughs> something like that. No, whatever it was at that time. And, and, you know, by the standards of the 19th century, Rothschild was like a, like a Bill Gates. You know, some of those, yeah, ten, by, the, by the standard of money, that, listen, you're talking about money at that time. So if Rothschild had, you know, hundreds of millions, of what's, what's that equal to today? Get it? So uh, the only problem is like this. You know, it's the old Jewish line. I have a great idea. You should give money to me. It's a great idea, you know. So uh, that didn't work. You know, Rothschild said, well, forget that. So Herzl had to do a backup plan. And... The backup plan is what resulted in the most unusual uh, result because the backup plan was you have to create a movement, a Zionist movement, which led to a whole series of chain events on its own. And notice you've got to do something never done before, something beyond Jewish imagination. You have to create an international Jewish political movement, create an organization such as never existed since the destruction of the Jewish state back in the time of the Romans. Not a state. That was not possible in 1895. Not a church. Herzl was an atheist, but an organization. Vos haste the organization. There's no Jewish word for organization. They had to create one now, Irgun, you know. It's not a Jewish word. That's a, it's a modern 19th century concept, an organization. Vos he does. But on the contrary, that's why it's modern and it's good. And so the result is, I want a modern, secular, I repeat, secular political organization based on the conviction that the Jews around the world are not a religion but a nation. Hear what I just said? They're not a religious nation. Now, he wouldn't deny their religion, you know, if you want to do that, but you don't have to. I'm not a Shomer Shabbos. You're a Shomer Shabbos. We're both Jewish, right? Even you admit that. So it's a, a national definition. A nation scattered into many parts, that's true, but a nation that would like to reconcentrate and reestablish a geographical state just like the other nations. Now, not every nation in 1895 had its own country. The Poles, for example, were <laughs> ripped up in other countries. But... Basically speaking, usually, that's what people want, their own state. Now, the notion that the Jewish people are a nation, like the French or Italians, is a from notion. I'll say it again. Jewish religion is funny. The taxonomy is very difficult. We're not exactly a religion. We're not exactly a nation. We're not exactly an ethnic group. We're a submission, a, a child of all that. But we're, we, we are a nation. I mean, going back to the Bible. You understand? We are a nation. It's not like Christianity. There is a national component. The Jewish people... If someone converts to Judaism, which they can do, you become part of the family. You don't become part of the, of the group of believers. It's, a, it's an interesting concept. 
But the from Jews never undertook to turn this idea into an organization. For one thing, we religious Jews are too divisive and averse to yielding autonomy and acting in concert, or are there not a hundred shoals in the city of Baltimore, right? This became clear when the Aguda was founded in 1912, uh, and it was supposed to be a union of all the organizations that had Rechaim Brisker and people like that, but it, it didn't turn into anything real as a political organization. It, it very quickly uh, fell apart. You just have the name. There wasn't really a, you can't compare the Aguda to the Zionist movement or something like that. Uh, I mean, a real organization with organizational discipline, whose members support the organization above other things, an organization like the Socialist International, that kind of business. Now, how is Herzl supposed to do that? Jews had none of this and no tradition of this. How do you create an organization that's not a joke? Like so many other Jew Jewish organizations are a joke. I mean, how, many or how many organizations can you count in the next five seconds that are on paper? I could do 12, you know, right? So, uh, really. Now here, his PR genius was his best asset. The guy was a journalist. So the equivalent today would be, you say, he was an internet expert. You understand? That would be the equivalent today. In the 19th century, he was a journalist. At a time when everybody read the paper. You and I are living in a time when newspapers are dinosaurs and falling into desuetude. Is that not true? But we're all old enough, I think, as I look around this crowd, most of you anyway, to remember a time once upon a time there was a real thing called a newspaper. And people read it. In fact, you'll be shocked, there were two newspapers a day. <laughs> you had the Baltimore Sun in the morning and the evening Sunday afternoon, and, and that was true around America. And some people got two or three papers a day. And uh, th think about that. Now, uh, so he knew all that. And uh, he was, as you see in the next slide, he was a journalist for the New Free Press, the Neue Freie Press. Uh, that, that was like the New York Times, more or less, of Vienna. Uh, and that was a major newspaper in Central Europe. So he was a journalist journalist. He had a real job. Now, PR genius means you understand mass psychology, because you can't sell papers if you don't understand mass psychology. Agreed? Herzl knew that the Jews are not going to take him seriously, unless the Goyim took them seriously. Then the Jews will say, ooh, okay, if you have real Gentile elite figures, right, just go across that, oh, the Goyim, that's what that, that they'll say. If you do that, then maybe there's something to it. This is because of the low self-image the Jews had. And so if they couldn't get validation from people outside the faith, then they'll say, oh, another Herzl, another fool, you know, uh, a journalist writing about a, a pipe dream. So he knew this, because he was Jewish. And, uh, he had a piece of luck, because right out in late 1895, he wrote the, the pamphlet, and not long afterwards, the pamphlet was read in a bookstore by a Jerry Falwell type. I kid you not, in Vienna, a guy named Vil William Wilhelm Heckler, who uh, uh, was a uh, Protestant fundamentalist, originally from England, but very German as well. And uh, Heckler came, as I say before, from a German-British background, and. Uh, he uh, was uh, enamored of German culture, and he became tutors in the elite families and the royal, royal families in, England, in, in uh, Germany. And uh, he was very much one of these messianic type Christians, in which he's really looking for the Jews to go back to Israel and then convert. Right? But who cares? He wants the Jews to go back to Israel. And he sees this, he wrote books saying that now is the time it's going to happen, and here's a Jewish guy that, that proves it. You know what I'm saying? So no, it fit in like a glove with his theology. But he was a real person. He had been in Russia during the pogroms in 1881. Yeah, he was there. Uh, he had actually met Leon Pinsker, who was the founder of the Chove Sion movement in Odessa. I mean, uh, the guy wasn't a, 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 just a, some fool. He did have understanding of the Jewish problem. And he was a chaplain of the British Embassy in Vienna, which is a real job. And he had been tutor, tutor, for the children of one of the German kings or rulers, the Grand Duke of Baden. Here's uh, Germany, if you can see it over here. This is Germany under the Kaiser. Contrary to popular belief, Germany was not a single country but a federation. Maybe you know that, maybe you don't know that. Uh, it was actually not called the Empire of Germany, but the German Empire, the Deutsches Reich. And the King of Prussia was the leading prince, and therefore he was the Kaiser. But all the other princes had independent states within that area. So look how big the Kingdom of Bavaria is, even though it's part of Germany, for example. The Kingdom of Saxony is a separate country. The Kingdom of Württemberg is a separate country within the German Reich. And it worked very well for them. It was a federal system and it did work. Instead of a president of the United States, you have the Kaiser, but nevertheless it worked. One of the states here is Baden. You see it down there? It's not very large, 
but it's a, a real country once upon a time. It was a Grand Duchy, it's a Grand Duke of Baden. So the guy is somebody. And Heckler had been the tutor of the child of the Grand Duke of Baden. And, uh, and, the, uh, and the kid died. And uh, that cemented the close relationship the former tutor had had with the Grand Duke. So here's the guy whose son died, it's him at his older age. Uh, he was a German prince, as you can see, and he was the uncle of the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm. And so, uh, when Herzl meets Heckler, because Heckler says, I just read your pamphlet, it's amazing, I've been saying the same thing all the time. Now I see the third coming, the fourth coming, and this is really amazing, and you know, we're on the same page and all the rest of it. And Herzl, who was atheist, said, yeah, 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 but who do you know? You get it? He says, well, I know the Grand Duke of Baden. Now we're talking. You can't get me in the city Grand Duke I can definitely get you to see Grand Duke of how about the Kaiser? Not so push it, but we can work on it. No, where do you, where do you, where does a Jewish guy like like Herzl find the guy? This guy, you, uh, you understand? If he was religious, he said God is a God of this. You see? Yeah, where where do, where do you find this thing that you can get in actually to see somebody? And so um, Herzl very very sympathetically received by Frederick, the Grand Duke of Baden. Oh, it's the Goyen. That's real. He said, "What well, the Jews like? Who's this Herzl guy? Some jerk." No, he was actually received in, formally in court and greeted in a friendly way by the grand. Really? Oh, that's different. This puts him in an amazing position with the fellow Jews. You mean they take him seriously? Well, this gains him traction with the Jews. So that's part of his knowledge, that we Jews are like that. You understand? We have our weaknesses, and this is one of them. Buoyed up by this re re recognition, Herzl travels to Constantinople to talk to the Turks. He was on a high, and they own Palestine. And he basically said like this, would you be willing, because he didn't believe, I'll say this again, part of Herzl was, I'm not looking for a shtick, for secret uh, uh, intrigues, for backdoor deals. Kyle Weitzman did that. Herzl said like this, I want this up front uh, so that there won't be any Arab-Israeli conflict afterwards, <laughs> you might say, and everything should be settled over here. Can't we do it for money? Would you sell it to the Jews in exchange for bailing out the terrible debt? Now the answer was no. But Herzl could then say to the Jews, I was received at the court in Constantinople. I negotiated with the Turks. Now, here's Herzl. Here is Herzl. He didn't see him the first time. He saw him another time. And this guy said, no, no, no. But on the other hand, you, you know, it's PR. You can say, Herzl saw the Grand Duke of Baden. He saw the, uh, uh, the Turkish Sultan. Now, why do I have Trump over here with the President of China? Yeah. I'll I'm going to tell you now, aren't I? <laughs> it's like a black church. He <laughs> said, the... Uh, <laughs> Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. The Ottoman Empire was in deep financial trouble. The United States of America, my friends, is in deep financial trouble. We got a 20 trillion debt. Now I'm going to ask an uncomfortable question. You don't have to give the answer. What if the president of China is going to say to Trump, "I'll pay the 20 trillion and give me Taiwan. You won't have any. You won't have any debt anymore." You are what Herzl was talking about. <laughs> Anyhow, the point is, no, no, no. So Herzl thought, how can you turn out a deal like that? How can you turn out a deal like that? Um, but on the other hand, they did, because the ruler, Abdul Hamid, the Tultan of Turkey, was a uh, Turk and a Muslim, and why should he want to give up his own territory, sacred territory, uh, for money? Now, Herzl uses this Gentile political traction to assemble a group of supporters and announce in the press that a public political meeting of like-minded Jews from all over Europe and the world, there's the press, the PR, international Jewish meeting interested in Eretz Yisrael aspect of Jewish life from whatever point of view will take place in the following year in August of 1897. This has never happened. Remember I started out today saying the Jews have no organization, never even tried to get together. There never was any at all isn't this interesting? As late as 1897, there was never anything at all of one group in which he tried to get Jewish delegates in any form whatsoever from all over the world. And he said, we're going to do it. Uh, and I want them to think in national terms about how to respond to anti-Semitism and build a Jewish presence of some sort, political Jewish presence in Eretz Yisrael. In other words, I want representatives of every Jewish community in the world to come together to think about the Jewish people as the Jewish people, which is something that's never been done weird. Jews are smart people. They never actually had a meeting of all the Jews or representative of all the Jews to think about Kalal Yisrael. Not the Gerich Hasidim. Right? Not the Jews in Germany. 
not this group over here and that group over there, but everybody, in realistic terms. Uh, now, he originally wanted to, that's a lot of groups. And that's the idea, to get them all together, unite them in a single organization, if possible. The opposite of the usual Jewish practice, which is you break up into 10 shtibbles the minute there's a slight uh, difference of opinion on who gets shlishi. You understand? <laughs> that, 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 that's who the Jews are. You know, when there was any little, it's a sad fact. You know, the organizations break up all the time, correct? Uh, how about trying it the other way? The Gentiles do it. You know, let's, let's try it. Get an international organization of Jews in which you won't break up. Now, the original location was supposed to be in Munich in, uh, in southern Germany. But the German rabbis in Munich and the area protest. They call protest rabbina. This is, the this is going to be funny what I'm going to say. This is the leading reform rabbi in Germany. Okay, so I understand. Uh, Caesar Seligman. I understand why he protested. This is the rabbi in Frankfurt, not Breuer, the anti Breuer. Yeah, if you know Frankfurt, there's the Breuer Shoal and then the other one. So this is Marcus Horowitz, who was a famous Talmud Chacham and all the rest of it. And he saw like this can't have Zionism in Germany. This is against the Jewish religion. Cause, no, because we're not, we're not a nation. It's, it's, it's a shocking. You see? No, that yeah, from Jew would do this. It was a from guy, but believe me. And yet, the zeitgeist was what it was. And so, fine, it won't be in, uh, in uh, Germany. We'll make it in, in Switzerland where there are no Jews. That's great. <laughs> Nobody can protest. In Basel. In Basel. And so they had it there. Who's going to pay uh, cost expenses? Uh, after all, you're going to invite people. They're going to show up for a hotel. What are you going to do? Uh, and so, now listen to this. The idea was a crazy idea, unless you don't think it's a crazy idea. Here and there, he found Jews that when he published these ideas, for every 20 people said he's nuts, one of them said he's not nuts. One of them was Jacobus Kahn, who was uh, uh, 24 years old and had uh, been the president of a bank, from banking, from president of a bank in Amsterdam, a big bank. That's where the queen kept her money. I'm serious. In uh, Amsterdam, and uh, not religious or anything like that, and he's enthralled by this idea. He says, I'll pay, I'll pay the expenses. Send me the bill. He uh, was a, a major supporter of Zionism. It's 25, 30 years. Um, more, actually. He was killed in the Holocaust in an old age. It's a sad story. Um, th that is the power that the Zionist idea had among some. That it could take someone who had no connection with Judaism whatsoever and fired him up to take money out of the pocket. Okay? Now, uh, okay, you got somebody's paying for it, you got it there. And Herzl sent out definite instructions. Tuxedo, white gloves. Okay? Uh, because the media will be present, and I told you, the whole point is making a media event. Because the truth of the matter is, it's a fake. What I mean is a fake? It's not really a representative group of Jews from Britain. Nobody elected anybody. You know what I'm saying? But, but we want it to look like it is. Like, like you say, the media is the message. If we can make it look like a Congress of Jewish people, that'll have an effect. And of course he was right. And so 200 delegates, I call you know, quote unquote delegates, from all over Europe uh, show up. And by the way, the media was, I mean, look, look at this. He looked very dignified, and he's in a tux. And they're doing it uh, not as a Jewish, uh, you know, it's not like a shul meeting up, they scream at each other. Robert's Rules of Order, I'm serious. And all that sort of business, and he made sure that the press had the right box, and the speeches were given in German at the right tone, all the rest of it. It's all about making an impact on the media, because if the Gentiles are respected, then the Jews are respected. Otherwise, the Jews won't give it any attention. This is what it's all about. Um, 200 delegates show up. Now, what delegates? Uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, I'm coming <laughs> you know, as a delegate. Uh, 200 delegates from all over Europe, plus the rabbi of the Glen Avenue show representing the Western Hemisphere, uh, who elected him. Right? Now, it wasn't, a, it wasn't Glen Avenue. It was uh, in, down in West Baltimore. It's German street show. Not, but it's before McCullough. Uh, Dr. Schaffer, there you have it. This is the first rabbi who shares Israel. Okay? Uh, and he was the only American delegate to the first Zionist uh, conference. This is the uh, great distinction of Sheriff Israel. Now, um, Herzl was successful. What do I mean successful? He got in the Gentile press. It's in the front page of the London Times. It's the front page of the New York Times. Isn't this the modern internet mentality? It's about getting your message out there, right? And repeating over again. The average Jew didn't even know what I'm talking about. They barely had a few Hebrew newspapers that were a joke. And here's a guy, on the other hand, who's coming from the cutting edge of journalistic technology in Western Europe in the 1890s. See, he understands mass newspapers, 
uh, getting the message out there and all that kind of thing. That, that was his uh, unique contribution. And also, therefore, once it gets in the front page of the Gentile press, oh, it gets in the front page of the Jewish press. Now, the reaction is varied. Many are uh, amazed that this bull artist, as they see him, gets any traction. It got taken seriously by the non-Jews. Like, how did this Schmendrick pull it off? You know what I'm saying? Hurts all. Yeah, you know. Uh, but the Gentiles do treat it as a congress of the Jewish people, which is something that never existed before. So all the Jews used to think like this. Don't ever make a congress of Jewish people. It'll get everybody angry. They'll think we're nuts. The guy did it, and he actually got respect. <laughs> you see? He got respect. And so what's that? Oh, my. So even though everyone's aware that the movement wasn't really elected by anybody, that the movement was an actual democratic congress, but it looked like one. That was the whole point about the tuxedos, the robbers' rules of order, and dignified speeches where delegates spoke on behalf of the whole Jewish people. In other words, it was a brilliant example of the use of, to use, as we say in 2017, fake news. <laughs> Zionism was, true or not, Zionism was created as a fake news. It wasn't really representing anybody. It wasn't really, dumb, but I'm wrong. It got the traction. Herzl did take care to have all opinions represented. He had political Zionists like himself who want to get a Jewish state. He had Chovei Siyam, practical Zionists, who said, who said, you'll never get a Jewish state. It's a crazy idea, like a Chana Am over there. Let's go to the next uh, business over here. You know, all different types. Max Nordau is a secular nationalist. Rav Shem uh, Mulver, who wasn't there but sent a message, was obviously Orthodox. This guy is Usishkin, the Russian Zionists who say, just build more colonies, don't try to think about a state. You know, there are many approaches to it. But his whole point was like this. Let's get everybody in one organization and let's fight out among ourselves and come out with a united opinion, which is what the Democratic Party is supposed to do, which is what the Republican Party is supposed to do, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party, and every real organization. There are different factions. That's fine. There are different interests. And come out with something that we can all agree on and then go with it. Right? Instead of saying, I'm making my own stiebel. And so was there opposition? Of course, you know, again, was there, of course there was opposition. The Frum obviously had issues even though it's not so posh it. Uh, the fact that Herzl was an atheist uh, who couldn't read Hebrew uh, made it impossible to imagine him and his movement as Jewish. I mean, if you're Hasidic or something like that, you know, huh? who is this guy? On the other hand, it's not so simple. Some Rabbanim figure like this. Listen closely. If he's secular, then he's not reform or conservative. Do you get that? He's not trying to redefine Judaism. He just said he doesn't know anything about it. That's not so bad. Like in Israel today. And that's okay. I don't know. Okay? Um, he wasn't trying to change the Jewish religion. And that's why you did have, as you see in the next slide, famous rabbis that were for and against him. This is Rabbi Rhinus, who started Mizrahi movement, who stayed with him all of his life. This is Rabbi Cyrilson and El Yaqib Rabinowitz, who were famous rabbis who started out Zionist and they, they switched the middle, became anti Zionist. It was what to talk about, at least. Aside from the, from, from the religious, Herzl was bitterly opposed by Reform Judaism. Well, the whole point of Reform Judaism is Berlin is uh, Jerusalem. No, we, we like it here. We don't want to go anywhere. And why should we fake it? Right? Why did they change? Listen, don't make fun of Reform. They said to the Orthodox, why do you say we want to go back to Israel every day? So go. If you're not going, you're a liar. So what are you making fun of me for? You're a hypocrite. He's right. Herzl was profoundly opposed by assimilationist Jewish leaderships, what we would call today uh, the, you know, the Federation, their associate, all that kind of stuff, all the big American Jewish Committee, those types, uh, by Marxists of all varieties who say, no, don't make a Jewish nationalism, get rid of all nationalism, create, you know, make it with a, with a classless society. On the other hand, many were turned on to their Jewish identity by Zionism. There's no question about it. In general, in the West, Zionism was metaher hatameim, which is another way of saying, this is, there were many examples, as I just saw at the time, Many students in, in college who, who, were, who were ashamed of their Judaism all of a sudden became proud. Many people, doctors, lawyers, bankers, CPAs, and things like this, who always hid their Jewishness all of a sudden found a certain pride. Because you can't identify, these people are not from, they can't identify with religion. But they can identify with them, this notion, and it looked good, and it seemed modern, and it makes me proud. What can I tell you? It makes me proud to feel Jew. I never felt that before. There are many, many cases like this. Um, now in the East, it was sort of metame at horem. You know, there many religious people became not religious, but nevertheless, it had a huge impact on the Jews. But enough of that. Now I want to close by getting down to practical politics. The first Zionist Congress 
I'm going to wrap this up. The first Zionist Congress said, we want a Jewish something or other in Palestine, secured by legality, recognized by the world, peacefully, as a state or something like that. But there was no way Turkey is going to do it. <laughs> That's a little bit of a problem. This was a problem that Herzl could not solve. So here you are in 1897, 1898, 1899, and so forth, saying, you want a state in Israel? Oh, yeah? Fine. You know the old line. All you have to do is convince the Turks. <laughs> okay. How are you going to do that? Uh, now, it's complicated. In the time we're talking about 1890s, the whole world was owned by 10 nations. It's the good old days of European imperialism. If you go down the list, Britain, France, Germany, Russia, Belgium, Italy, Portugal, Japan, USA, Netherlands, maybe I left somebody out, I don't think so. They own the whole globe. They own the whole globe. Now, you think I'm, you think I'm exaggerating. Uh, here, go to the next map. Uh, here is the British Empire with all this color. Here's the French Empire with all this. Into China. Here's stupid little Portugal with all this. Here's stupid little Belgium right, with all this. By the way, the Belgians were doing a Belgian Congo. I want to tell you something. You probably don't know this. Hitler killed 6 million. The Belgians killed 10 million. I'm sorry to say. It was, it was, they, ran a, they ran an Auschwitz. For many, many years, nobody did anything about it. You understand? If, if you have the stomach to do it, go online and look it up. I'll say it again, 10 million. So this is when Europe could get away with anything. Herzl hoped that the European nations might pressure Turkey. So he met with all the European leaders. Here he, here he had a meeting with the Kaiser. And next slide, there's a, it's a photo montage. But it happened in Israel, they made a statue. Uh, he had meetings with, with, the, with the Pope, with King of Italy, with the German princes, with the Minister of Interior Russia. You know, he went around all over the place, and basically his only hope was maybe one of these countries can push Turkey into doing it. Now, it didn't happen. We know that. But he thought, give it a try. Um, and Turkey wasn't that weak. I mean, here's a Turkish Empire at the time of Herzl. It's, it's not so small, right? Here's Turkey and all of Israel and Syria and uh, Iraq and uh, other territories. So it is what it is. So for that reason... Zionism in the time of Herzl seemed quite unrealistic. But then he achieved an astonishing success in a weird way. Um, and I'm talking about Medinat, Uganda. Now, what do I mean over here? England is a giant empire. They had so much land, they didn't know what to do with it. And so the Secretary of State for the Colonial Ministry at that time, Joseph Chamberlain, his father was the famous Neville Chamberlain. So Joseph Chamberlain, his day, was an unbelievably charismatic politician. He had a, <laughs> this is like a joke, he had a Jewish friend, Leopold Greenberg, who, who was the editor of the Jewish Times, Jewish Chronicle, as they call it. And Leopold Greenberg said, can't you do something for my friend Herzl? And Joseph Greenberg said, Let, let's see what we got. <laughs> you know? And England had so much territory, it's like this. This is really, as you see, we're talking, what you call Uganda means Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. So all together, it's a big area. Let that be the state of Israel. Now. Besides everything else, I just want to realize the guy was a bluffer. He had nothing behind him, and he got a real country to offer him real land. You, you get what I'm saying? No, that's incredible what I just said. Even though it's the age of imperialism, how the heck did you do that? It was, that's a remarkable fact. You know, they didn't offer him a postage stamp, right? They offered him a real country. Whatever its pluses or minuses, put that aside for the moment. He got attraction. He just didn't get the attraction he wanted. Now, by the way, Herzl took the deal, but the Zionist movement said no. Either Israel or nothing. Uh, and Herzl died shortly afterwards, and uh, it, you know the whole proposal didn't work out. Uh, they had so much land in England that they could give away a piece. You understand? Now, uh, uh, this is not something to laugh at. Uh, let's go to the next slide. What if there would have been again? I'm just making this up. Let's dream for a second. What if they would have had a Jewish state in Uganda? Wouldn't be no Hitler. Yeah. You wouldn't have the St. Louis with the refugees going that nobody will take in. Get it? That's how Herzl was thinking. Now, I'm not saying it's right or anything, but I'm just saying the guy wasn't crazy. So it didn't happen. He died shortly later. After he's only 44 years old, he had a bad heart, so he died from a heart attack. So here we come to the end. Where is this new movement going? If Turkey is implacably opposed, and no territory other than Palestine is acceptable, what is the plan? After the initial hoopla, Zionism by 1905 seemed an impossible dream.
to be continued. Good night.